the first thing to say about what's happening in America, I think it's very striking. So some things in America are working. The bureaucracy of the counting is very, very good. Right? I mean, it's, not, it's slow, it's steady. It's got that, if you've been in America, you know there's a, a sort of, a, 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 we actually rather like speed in this country and Americans are capable of speed. But there's a, a systematic, we're taking it our own time, we're doing all these pieces of paper, we're queuing up for five hours. Americans stand in line for much longer um, than Brits. And you, uh, I have a, a, a daughter and grandchildren who are in, in the States. And, you know, I'm very struck by the way in which people stand in line and, you know, just, just take their time. And, and, and the cars drive very carefully at very massive numbers, very slow speed. So, that sense of America is we got it sorted, we know what we're doing, we know what the rules are, we're gonna work. That is, that is on display. At the same time, it's the country which invented this phrase, vote early and vote often. And lots of, there's a long history of voting machines being manipulated, of people breaking the rules. Uh, Kennedy stole the 1960 election using uh, Mayor Daley in, in Chicago and LBJ, who was his vice president in Texas, Texas and Illinois were effectively stolen from Nixon. Nixon understood that that's what happened, uh, wrote about it, said, you know, so um, there's, there's, uh, uh, the, there's a winner takes all culture in the United States, which, which is very ruthless. Um, and one very big and deep part of this is voter suppression. And it's not slavery, it's Jim Crow. It's what happened after the Civil War and the repression of blacks. And, and I think this is one of the big issues behind the whole health, health thing now. Uh, they, they refuse to have a health service. A, a health service incorporates, makes real citizens of our resources of everybody. And it was the Southern states, I think you'll find, um, that actually blocked the early attempts to create a, a proper public health system in the, in the US. So you've got different, different things going on. Um, and I think it's, it, so it isn't just broken, uh, that, but there are very big attempts to break it. And the good news is that for the first time, people really understand this in my view, and really see it as an issue. Obama, when he had the Senate in his in 2008, could have given statehood to Washington, D.C., just to, in terms of the balance of power in the Senate. He could have passed legislation saying everybody must be registered to vote, and he didn't. What, okay, so there was a financial crisis or other priorities, but it wasn't up there on the agenda. They had to actually uh, turn America into a real democracy, and I think that is changing. So we can go back into the big history, the deep history of it, if you want. But I think it's really <laughs> it's one of the things about a broken system, and we've got one here, is that that there is a spirit to make democracy work, and part of our political systems are open to that. I suppose one of the things that I find fascinating is that there's this kind of cultural obsession in America with the founding fathers, with the constitution. And they treat kind of injustice, you know, the genocides on which the country was founded and so on, as an aberration of that system, rather than understanding that, you know, the founding fathers are a bunch of white men, many of whom owned slaves, who were entrenching power for white men like them. And that the history of America since then has been entirely in keeping with the system they set up. Yeah, well, there's a Jekyll and Hyde character to the United States. So, and, and, and this goes, but the quite deep historical uh, uh, processes here. And it's one of the things after, which I'm old enough, proud that I say this with some pride, to recall it with the, the whole movement about Vietnam. And it broke the kind of anti-war movement in that one part of the anti-war movement said, look what we're doing in Vietnam. This is appalling. This is not how America should be. Uh, we don't go out and slaughter people. We don't break the rules like this. This is unacceptable. This is not what it means to be American. And the leadership 
much of the leadership became became uh, uh, politicized in a sort of narrow way. And they said, no, it's systemic. This is what America is like. America is nothing but an imperialist country, a genocidal country. And a, a, a kind of cultural division opened up between these, these two forms of self-identification which came out of that protest movement. And the thing is, America's both. It is both one of the most wonderful, pluralistic, constitutional, rights-based, open and, and, and energetic and creative countries. And it is one of the most ruthless, slaughtering, uh, genocidal states that has ever existed. And, and uh, uh, this does go back to, the, um, to the, the founding moment. And it also goes back in a, in a different and parallel way to the founding moment of the British constitution. And our problem here is that America is, it, 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 it's, its world supremacy is ending, has ended since the Iraq war, has ended in this century, but it's still a very vital, and it's still the dominant country and its economic system is still, its finance system is still the dominant one. Whereas we are in a kind of shrinking, real declining policy and, have, and don't even have the argument about the nature of our constitution. Um, we're not, we know every, the, 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 the form of decline here is to repress the debate about it, which is completely different from what happened in the 19th century. So I give a simple example of this. People often say, and will still say, we don't have a constitution, which is bollocks. Uh, uh, in the 19th century, in the height of Victorian, it was inconceivable that people would say that. You know, people argued, people were passionately about, it. they believed that the, the constitution was the explanation for uh, Britain's imperial greatness, for its outstanding character. So people went, you know, the idea that people, they didn't have a paper constitution, but that was an, a sign of our superior nature of the constitution, not a fact that we didn't have one. And it wasn't a refusal of the argument. And so there's been a corruption, mental corruption here, I think, due to a kind of Fabian Mandarin mentality, which came in after the First World War. It's been documented by Ferdy Mounts, wrote a rather good book about this. And, and, and people, it became a kind of specialist issue. So one of the ways in which the regime here preserved itself was to remove the constitution, the nature of the, the, how we make the rules, from public discourse, turning it into a specialist issue. So I think let me, um, at the length of going, on, I will go on for too long, but let me try to summarize it very simply. First, a constitution does three things. It sets the rule, I mean, formally there's one thing, which is it sets the rules for how you change the rules. So, but that is a cultural thing. That isn't just a matter of what, was written down on paper, it's how you actually behave it. We can see in America today, and we can see in the British Parliament. If you just decide, one lot of people just decide to play the rules differently, then the rules get played differently. So it's not set in stone. It's always lived. It's always more important how it's lived than anything else. I think you'll find that Liberia has the same written constitution as the United States. Constitution doesn't tell you what kind of country you are as a piece of paper or as a set of rules. So, and within that, the constitution does three things. It, it tells you about the relationship between the different centers of power, between your parliament and your judges, between the different, between the local government and the national government, and who can tax and who can't. It defines the rights and freedoms of the individual, of your liberty, whether you can vote, whether you can, how you can be jailed, that process of what your rights and your freedoms are. And it, it has an, an, another element, which is a bit more difficult to grasp, which is it is an expression of the aspiration of what kind of country you want to be. So South Africa has a constitution saying we don't want to have an apartheid constitution. German constitution is about not becoming a re return to become a fascist constitution. The Iranian constitution is about trying to be an Islamic state. And these are aspirations 
They aren't something which it delivers. And, and this is true of all constitutions. And the thing about the Anglo-British one is that there is embedded in this aspiration a complicated history. And what we aspire to is open to conflict not just class conflict, social conflict, you know, religious conflict, it's open, that, and that conflict is ongoing, it's lived. It's historical, but it's lived. So I'm being a bit abstract here, so. And when you talk about the Anglo-British constitution, that's a phrase people won't be familiar with, to the Anglo-American constitution, that's a phrase people won't be familiar with, you know, that this idea that the British and American constitutions grow out of the same event, the same moment. So I wonder if you could just explain that history to us quickly. Yeah, well, you, you, historically, the, the American and the British constitutions are um, umbilically connected. And the event which does this is the American War of Independence. And with with the American War of Independence, when George III pushed for it, and when this country lost the American War of Independence, the king was thrown out of the cabinet. So cabinet government, that's to say a government separate from the, the monarch, but part of this, this combination of the crown in parliament. So governing in parliament with the approval of the monarch, but now the monarch is out of the executive, began at the same time that the American, American Constitution itself were having, was codified. And I think, because I emphasize this point about constitutions, including written ones being a process. So you could say that there was a two generations through the American Constitution was really finalized, if you like, in its terms of its initial phrase by the end of the Civil War. And Lincoln, justified the civil war because the formal constitution allowed states to secede and, and legislated for slavery. And so they went back to the Declaration of Independence to we the people, which is the aspirational aspect of the American constitution, and said this has priority. The war, that was the legal justification for the civil war. Um, and uh, the, the, the same process took place over in this country, which was the, through the great, the process of the great reform bill of 32, 1832, into the sort of development of kind of high Victorian government. And when Badgett wrote, if you like, the first crucial formative book uh, about the, what he called the English constitution, he described it as a republic. And what he meant by that was that while we, there was a decorative element of the monarch, the real government was taking place inside the cabinet, inside the executive. The executive was drawn from parliament so that we fuse the legislative and the executive element, unlike the United States. And he boasted that this is a much more efficient and effective way of, of having a Republican government than was in America, which is suffering from the Civil War and so forth. And what he meant by Republican, and what, what you know, Madison meant by Republican, was not a democracy. That's to say, it, it, it had elected representatives, but it was a form of elite rule. And that solved a problem. The invention of representative democracy in that way solved a huge problem for a growing capitalist elite. And the problem they faced was this. They wanted armies so they could impose their will, expand the United States, slaughter the Indians, impose colonies. They had to have a modern army and they had to defend themselves against other countries that had modern armies. Was, this was the early industrialization and the first you know, real industrial warfare. And the threat they faced of that was the Napoleonic threat. That's to say, the possibility of one figure using their armies to dominate them. So they had to have a constitutional framework to defend themselves from the Bonapartism, from their own dictatorship. And at the same time, they wanted to have a framework which saved them from the rule of the mob. And, and that 
Well, we may look at that and say, God, these people weren't Democrats, that's terrible. You must remember that the, the industrial, the early industrial populations were completely illiterate. They were a mob. They could become a mob. They weren't, they weren't uh, literate, they weren't articulate, and they were very easily manipulated, and there were religious forces at work and so on. And, and you could argue that uh, um, they saw the threat of fascism very early because Hitler drew a lot from the, from the peasantry from the, and, and from those early mobilizations. So, the, uh, so the, the, it wasn't just kind of, it, it, we, we have to be careful about the, the, the civilized elite, which developed the separation of powers and then the fusion of powers within that, and the representative structure was both trying to create a, a, a class rule at home, be able to use force without any restraint of law abroad, the double nature, which was here also in Britain, exactly the same as in the United States, slaughtering people in India, this, you know, dev sort of, you know, devastating Beijing and, 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 and New Delhi with the Indian mutiny ruthlessly, while conducting themselves as gentlemen at home and, and making sure that there was no such dictatorship ruling over them. And that's the origin of our system. And what we're now going through, I think, and now sort of hypercharged by the internet and mass literacy, and the internet is driving mass literacy in all sorts of ways, is we're beginning to see a challenge to Republican, elite Republican rule for the first time by people that want genuine democracy. And that is a constitutional argument, not a legal one. It's about how we ruled and what kind of people we are, what kind of, who is, who is included in us and what are the terms and how, how do we conduct ourselves? And one of my big worries for the left, if we understand all that, is that because the Republican system, as you describe it, is so under attack from what you might describe as fascist forces, from an even, even more elite rule system, authoritarian systems. So often the left rallies round trying to defend that system of Republican elite rule from those attacks. And people look at that and they say, well, this system's awful. You know, I, I in the last, you know, this year I've interviewed people from Carpathian Ukraine to Appalachian, Tennessee. And the first thing they say, if you ask them about politics, is I hate politics, it's awful, we need to change the whole system. That is, you know, that is the most common response you get right across the Western world, if you ask people about politics. And it really worries me to see progressives defend what's described as politics, the current system of Republican elite rule, from attack. What we should be doing is working out how to replace it with genuine democracy. Well, I think there's, it's very interesting because uh, um, Will Davis has got a new book which, uh, uh, which sort of um, uh, ad addresses this issue. And so I think there's some really interesting questions here which he haven't really worked through. And one of them is that uh, neo what neoliberalism is doing now is it's undermining one of the core structures of that Republican settlement, which is the separation of powers. So it's trying to marketize everything and it's, it's undermining the, the independence of the judiciary. It's undermining the independence of due process. You can see this very clearly in the States. You can see it very clearly in terms of the Johnson government here. And the left is sort of defending this, but the left, especially the, the more militant left, doesn't like the separation of powers, right? Sees this as sort of a bourgeois structure, which is holding back democracy. So we have to think through whether we want a uh, a, 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 politi a, a political system and a political culture where there isn't independent voices of culture, where you aren't, you all have to agree with the dominant ideology and are forced to do so, the China Chinese model, or if we are in favor of uh, something which we should inherit from the Republican settlement, which is the respect and autonomy of people, which means accepting a structure of human rights, 
And if once you accept the structure of human rights, then you no longer have uh, um, uh, a, a, if you like, a democracy dictated by the rule of the majority, because the majority then has to obey. You know, if the majority wants to introduce the uh, a death penalty, and if you've got a structure of human rights which says you can't kill people, then the majority has to submit to the structure of human rights. So you have to kind of come to a view about whether you think there are universal values, which, which then need to be defended from and implemented over and above any particular political, democratic, electoral outcome. I mean, I do believe that. So I think that, uh, um, and, and, but it is the case that socialism, the left, has never fully articulated a politics which integrates the separation of powers into its vision. And so there is, as uh, uh, people have said, there's a kind of strange uh, coincidence between neoliberalism and Leninism, which is that both see the autonomy of culture and the autonomy of other institutions as a threat to their political project. Yeah. when when. If you look in practice at what most people involved in the modern left think, in a sense, it's not so much that orthodox, almost Leninist view of socialism, but much more what you might call a radical left position of a belief in radical decentralized democracy. And while that often struggles to articulate itself, I do think if you if you look at the kind of social movement politics of in, in the States, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but also in, in the UK, even you know, a lot of kind of momentum and the movement for Corbynism, if not, you know, whatever Corbyn himself might think. There is a, a very strong pluralistic, decentralizing, radically democratic spirit to it, which wasn't the case, you know, 40 years ago. And, and the, the left of my generation, millennials, and also kind of younger generations, I think has, is beginning to form that kind of understanding of a form of socialism, which really, you know, historically socialism struggled with. Well, I, I agree with that and, and it fills me with hope and delight. Uh, uh, but I struck by the word spirit. You talk about this is a spirit. I think this is the spirit, but spirit is a bit uh, ephemeral, you know, and when you get into a battle between guns and the spirit, then the guns tend to win. You've got to actually, so it hasn't been, we haven't worked this out. That's what I'm saying. And I, I think so. And, and you can see this. If you mentioned Corbyn. I mean, Corbynism is, is one thing, all the energy and the support for it. But the leadership in particular of uh, Corbyn and now these books are coming out of the people that sort of group around him. I mean, they just they were just trying to seize parliamentary power and implement policies. I mean, they 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 didn't even turn back, say, you know, guys, comrades, this is going to take 15 or 20 years. There's so much we can do. We're in for a long time. This is, you know, look at the balance of forces. I mean, so, so there was a kind of, there was a kind of crazy sense that they could just seize the state and, and then deliver policies. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, but, but, and, and that, that existed. They could, they could do that because we, younger your generation didn't have an articulated political culture which could say oh, hold on a second you know we've got to change the regime here you know we can't we can't we can't you can't use a completely undemocratic political electoral system uh, you can't you, you know you can't just do that you know this is going to boomerang i mean you and all of that experience which we've got uh, and here, I think my generation is just as at fault, or more more at fault for not having been able to get get these arguments across. I mean, some of us tried very hard, um, but the 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 we have to break from the regime consciousness, uh, especially in the Anglo-Saxon powers. And I think that's starting to happen in America, but I don't think it's happening here yet. Yeah, for for me, the very simple way to understand this is, you know, as I say, I. I've traveled right across Europe. I've interviewed people in the States and, you know, right across the Western world in a sense, asking people what they think about politics. And if you have any kind of progressive politics, you have to believe 
that ultimately the way decisions are made are one person, one vote, rather than through the market or through authoritarian hierarchies. And so, you know, the process we have for doing that at the moment is politics. Yeah, if you ask most people in the Western world, and I've done this with thousands of people, what they think of politics, they'll tell you that the political system is entirely broken. And in none of the countries in which I've done that have any kind of progressive forces really got any serious answer to the problem that most people articulate when you ask them that question. You know, what, when I interviewed Bob Peoples in the mountains of Tennessee last week I think, I about think what he thought about American elections, so let's finish this point. And, and he said to me, oh, I, you know, I'm not interested in politics first. This is a, 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 a Scotch-Irish kind of um, septuagenarian in, in the mountains of Tennessee who has no internet. He says, you know, I think our political system is entirely broken. And he can give some examples, you know, lobbying and corporate power and so on. But he says, I think we need a whole new system that really gives power to the people. Now, that is a pretty articulate way of saying what essentially most people in the Western world think about politics. And they're right. And, and progressives need to find a way to formulate and articulate and codify that into a set of demands rather than just ignoring it and continuing to pretend we can use the state systems we have to deliver more progressive policies. Yeah, well, I... I... Uh, I don't want to agree with you too much, so I want to try and disagree with you, but it's a bit difficult. But, but the crucial point here is this, that for, for 50 years now, we have been living in a economic system which is seeking to marketize and marginalize the political world. And it is seeking to drive to uh, uh, to say that to, to drive market values into political decision making, to subordinate the state, uh, the way the, the state works, the way the civil service works, the way the education system works. So you're marketizing university and it's driven out the sense that there are public values and public priorities, which even if you have a market where you do have a market is there and is governed. And therefore, the political system has been undermined and, and corrupted, if you like, by uh, the economic order. And when people express the fact they're pissed off, well, I'm pissed off. I mean, you know, Hillary Clinton, before the last election, four years ago, collected, I think, $650,000 from Goldman Sachs for giving them three lectures and wouldn't even publish what she told them. And when challenged on this, said something more or less equivalent well everybody does it so why are you picking on me <laughs> to which you know you're going to say well in that case politics is fucked <laughs> excuse the uh, french expression and 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 that you're right to say that okay uh, but if we're going to reverse that we have to say what politics is about we have to actually look at whether politics is about replacing the market uh, people are not allowed to earn well are people not allowed to have businesses what is that what is the relationship what is the public sector and the public service if it's now been undermined if the old liberal sense of the independent form of government based upon the monarchy and the presidency and so on and so forth all those structures have now been been the republican structures if you like are no longer operating well what is our political culture and why should people trust that political culture when the left has been as dictatorial and monolithic as the worst aspects of the right historically? Um, and, and so, you know, we aren't there yet. We have to build that, we have to say what we think politics is about. And I think one thing here which is going to have and should be having, hasn't yet, has a big enough impact is the ecological crisis. Because the ecological crisis, and I wrote a long thing about COVID, which, is, which sort of accelerated this, is that you can see that COVID had to be governed. You can see that the environmental crisis has to be governed. This is why people like Murdoch are so wicked, because they're trying to make the environmental issue into something like, do you believe in it or do you not believe in it? Right? Hence all the mask stuff, the same idea that somehow or other, because you don't like reality, uh, you can pretend that it's all, all been made up by elites. And, and the need to govern 
the way our relationship with the environment, the need to put an end to the fossil fuel industry, the need to 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 to, to, to that need to sort of now govern pandemics, to govern what we are, the which itself is partly caused by the pressures on the environment, unrestrained pressures on the environment, on the forests and so on, pushing species into uh, the, 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 the circulation of the human blood. Um, th that poses an issue of, of what public services, what public values are, which are not like the traditional uh, Republican ones, which are how do we govern the mob, the unwashed. They're ones in which all of humanity comes together to say we've got to look after ourselves and our planet and our future generations. Um, and that then means that we need a, uh, a public language and a set of public values, which we say these belong to us and these will govern the market. And then we can start to drive the market out of politics. And it's only when you've driven that sense that, that of politics of, of the market of personal profit out of the political so that politics ceases itself to be a marketplace um, that people will say of course I believe in politics without politics we're nothing so without without the constitution democracy is nothing and um, without politics democracy can't exist I think you know one thing I've been thinking a lot recently and, and we need to wrap up in a moment but there's the quote that you and I cite a lot from the Scottish journalist Neil Asherson, who said that right. you, can, you can't get democratic socialism in the British state in the same way that you can't induce a vulture to give milk. And watching the American left emerge over the last couple of years in, in the exciting way that it has, it's been thrilling. Yes. But one of the things I keep wanting to say to them is you won't be able to get democratic socialism from the American state in the same way that you can't get a vulture to give milk. Just it's equally true of America as it is of Britain. And one of the things I worry about is that the American left gets sucked into this kind of elitist Republican system and, as a result, finds itself failing exactly the way the Biden generation failed and got drawn into the system. Well, I think there are certain reasons for slightly more optimism about the American system than the British system, because the American system, first of all, does have a codified constitution. So it's something which you can claim. If you don't, if you don't have a codified constitution, even though it may be run by and be written by an elite, you can still have a claim upon it. You can still have that argument. We can't even have that argument. Uh, uh, we can't begin to claim our country until we can start to say what the rules are. At the moment, you know, a, 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 there was one point when I think it was Robin Butler was a cabinet secretary and, the, and a group of students were being taken around the cabinet office. Uh, and one of them said to him, what is the constitution? And he said, the constitution is something we make up as we go along. And the we <laughs> was not we the people. <laughs> right? And you couldn't say that in America. So there's a plus there that the constitution does belong to them. And also, they have primaries. So although they have a, a winner-takes-all electoral college, the system is much more open to pressure and to movement from below. And it is quite possible for the American left. Bernie Sanders started off as a mayor, I think, in Vermont. So you can gain your control to some degree of the local town, and then you can try and drive the real estate operators out of the local council. There's a ways in which you can start to have that argument. Um, so I think American... Um, is, is much more open. The, the problem that the American left had, and to some degree still have, is they're obsessed with the presidency. But, the, but you could in America have a strategy where you're gaining the towns, where you're gaining the state legislatures, where you're gaining control over the voting systems. I mean, there's, there's a depth and an openness to American politics, which a really vitalized left is capable of getting to grips with. Um, but I just would say one other thing about what's happening in America, especially with some figures like AOC, who's just done an interview in the New York Times, is really great, which is this. And I'm, I'm putting it in very crude shorthand. What happened in 1968 was that the, the energy and the, of the opposition to what America was becoming was excluded from 
the political system. And it was partly, there were lots of arguments on the left about you, you've got to, you know, don't be, you've got to fight inside the Democratic Party, like in this country, so you've got to fight inside the Labour Party. There's no way around that. But it was also, and, and th that was a very important and the public argument. But one of the reasons for this division was that the apparatus of the Democratic Party, just like the apparatus of the Labour Party here, was ferociously against the cultural change, the energy, the, the feminism, the egalitarianism, you know, the sort of rule breaking, the, the uh, opposition to hierarchy that was represented by 68 taken as a whole. So even if the most intelligent figures, the creative figures that came out of the 60s, who wanted to make the system work, were pushed aside because, you know, they had some theory, they had ideas, they could talk about Gramsci, and that was an utter disqualification for allowing them to become an MP. And the same thing has happened in America. And what's really important here is that this new generation is beginning, is trying to take over the Democratic Party organically from below, using democratic methods. Uh, and, and, you know, they're up against, I mean, Aaron White's very brilliant people about the rage, which is just done in open democracy. I mean, I think he's our American, one of the, working as a North American editor for open democracy, you know, talking about Pelosi is worth over $50 million and is aged 80. The, the aging apparatus of the Democratic Party in Congress, you know, who are unbelievably wealthy. And you look at this, you think, my God, well, how, did they, how did they manage that? And, and they are going to be challenged and they're going to use administrative methods to push that back. And what happens if that happens? This is my, would be my message to them, not that they will listen to it, democracy, that's part of the problem. But my message to them would be, if you don't incorporate the energy in a creative dialogue into the ruling, potential ruling parties like the Labour Party and the Democratic Party, it will go into the right wing parties, the Republicans, Thatcherism here drew on the energy of 68. Reagan did exactly the same thing. So that, that you know, this is an immensely creative and historic moment. This is a crucial transitional moment that we are in. We've sort of been here before, but this is a unique one, absolutely transformed by the internet and the digital, you know, the, the replacement of analog life. And those analog hierarchies have got to go. They've got to be, they've got, with an intelligent, open-minded dialogue. Anthony Barnett, founder of Open Democracy and a long-term activist of the uh, English left. Um, thanks so much for your thoughts on the American yes. election and, um, and recent events around the world.